Nehemiah this evening, chapter number 11, Nehemiah this evening. That was a good song about the mansions, huh? Boy, that's good stuff. Amen. We're going to hit on a little bit of what we talked about last week, just in the beginning of our message, and then uh, because it leads into Nehemiah 11 uh, here. Just again, just want to keep this in front of us. The story started with Nehemiah. It started with God's vision for him. Uh, We spent a lot of time talking about what God was doing in his heart, about his prayer life, about uh, some of the challenges he's faced, uh, how the enemy attacked him uh, leading into his ministry. And then uh, right around chapter number seven, uh, the, 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 the view of the, the book changed from Nehemiah and the work there on the wall to the people and the things that God was doing with inside, uh, inside the walls with the people. And uh, we've been looking at that over and over. And, and uh, last week we spent a lot of time talking about how uh, now that they've experienced really a revival, uh, how their life has changed, not just inwardly, not just decisions they were making, but practical things that they were changing in their lives. And uh, in the beginning of last week, we had talked about um, how um, uh, the men uh, wrote down these things and they, they put their name out there. And we're going to pick that theme up because that actually begins in chapter number 11 here. We'll look at these first couple verses together and uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get started here. Notice in chapter 11, verse number 1, and it says, And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of every ten to dwell in Jerusalem, to the holy city, nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Let's pray together here tonight, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you again for the privilege that you give us to gather together tonight around the word of life. Uh, Lord, we just pray tonight that you would help us to take away some truth here that will help our church move forward. Uh, Lord, we're looking for you to guide us and direct us and to help us to take steps. Uh, Lord, we look forward to all that's in front of us in in heaven. We think of those mansions we sung about tonight. But Lord, so much work to get done here. So many cities to take. Lord, so much to conquer here, we pray. You would guide us, direct us, and give us men, Lord, who are willing to sacrifice for those moments. We'll thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice in our text here tonight, it says that, uh, and the people blessed all the men. And they blessed all the men, but not just every single man, but they blessed the men who were willing to sacrifice for the work of the ministry. Uh, You'll note here, um, if you haven't really uh, picked it up yet, but not everybody was living in Jerusalem at this time. Okay, It, It says that the rulers were living there, and then one out of every ten from the surrounding communities were sending men to live there. Okay, there's a reason for that. Jerusalem wasn't, number one, was never a safe place to live until the wall was built. And the city was in in ruins. Now, in Ezra, they were working on building up the city and getting it put back together, but it wasn't all the way back together yet, okay? Uh, It it, it wasn't a a place where you'd want to establish a family at this point. I don't know, maybe you could say that the plumbing wasn't up and running or you know, the, the facilities uh, weren't quite there, but whatever it was, not everybody was living inside the walls yet, if that makes sense, okay? And there was, uh, there was a level of sacrifice for those who needed to, uh, uh, to, to be there for, for the purposes of continuing to work and to maintain and to get the temple up. And, to, and, to, and the, the city was in ruins. Remember, if we go back to the, the beginning of, of the book of, of Nehemiah, and uh, it says that the, you know, the, uh, uh, and they said unto me in chapter one and verse number three, the remnant that are left in captivity that are in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And uh, the, the city was in, was in ruins. Okay. So Ezra helps get the temple up and going. Ne- Nehemiah comes in, helps get the wall up. Uh, but the city, the infrastructure and, and, and all of that was, was broken down. So there's still some, some work that needs to be done. Okay, and uh, um, so we see that the the rulers uh, stepped out by faith and they took this opportunity to say, you know what, we understand that everybody wants to live in this condition, but we'll step out and we'll do it. Okay, and then the the rest of the tribes and the rest of the people said, you know what, Uh, what we'll do is we'll draw, we'll, we'll cast lots 
here and uh, um, um, out of the men of our, our communities and out of our, our tribes and one out of every 10 of the men will join the, the leaders and uh, partake in this sacrifice. This is, this is, again, we've got to remember, this is revival living. This is a, a group of people who are experiencing a renewed vision of, of God and what God wants to do in their life. So this isn't, this isn't a big deal to them. This is what we need to do to get the work done. This is what we need to do to get back to normal. Okay, They're back to normal in the sense of spiritual, but there's still some practical realities of things that need to get organized, that need to get fixed, that need to be changed up, that need to be cleaned up, that need to be put together so that, so that they can be uh, functioning in a practical way back in, 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 in a, a revival living, the way that God wants it to go. Again, this, we've got to remember that as we read the story, as we work through these texts, this isn't about a group of people having what they want. This isn't a group of people, uh, you know, standing around saying, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to do it, you know, this is what we need to have, this is what we don't want to have, this, that, and the other thing. This is a group of people saying, listen, we haven't been living the way that God wants us to live. And God has confronted us with that truth through the preacher, Nehemiah and Ezra, and different ones, and through God's word. And our life, as it compares or stands in the shadow of God's word, is, is, is wrong and broken and, and out of touch with what God wants. So therefore, we're going to change the way we live, and we're going to change the way we're living, and we're going to change the circumstances for which and how we function to come into what God wants for us. Okay, so these are good truths for us to grab a hold of, church. Okay? As we stand, as we look into uh, you know, the, the, the realities of God's word, we have, to, we have to be willing to take personal inventory. Is, is my life, uh, you know, as it stands, under the scrutiny of, of God's word, is it where God wants me to be, or are there things that God wants to change? Do I need revival? Are there things in my life that God would say, get rid of these things and embrace these things? You know, there's these things that you need to, to incorporate into your life. There's these things you need to change in your life. Uh, and, and the issue isn't about what makes you comfortable or what you think is best for you or, uh, you know, what, what, what heritage you have in this, that, or the other thing. No, no, no. None of that matters. You have to set all of that aside. Because the issue at hand is not you, it's God. It's God. And what is God doing? And how is he moving? And where is he working? And listen, it's going to take people who are willing to lead out in that. It's going to take men to lead out in that. In your homes, in our church, in our community as a whole and at large. If you go through chapter number 11, <coughs> forgive me, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. We're not going to read through the whole thing here um, because, it's, again, it's, it's a list of things and there's a lot to learn in this list of stuff. Again, I'm not saying to, I want to minimize chapter number 11. I'm trying to hit the high spots as we get towards the end of the book here. Um, but you'll notice that uh, men are highlighted through this chapter. Again, it starts with their sacrificial decision, and we'll come back to that in just a minute, but you'll notice that it's the sons of so-and-so or the son of so-and-so, and, -so, and it's, it's these men who God highlights throughout this, and there's lots of them uh, throughout this, but it's also the rulers. So it's the sons, it's the men, it's the rulers, it's the brethren. And this is important for us to understand. Again, uh, uh, men have to understand their key role in our culture and in our community as Christians uh, that we have a responsibility to be leaders and rulers and brethren. Men who band together as brothers in the same cause, the cause of God's work moving forward. <clears throat> can I interject this here for a moment? I think oftentimes churches can band together around the wrong, around the wrong cause. We can band together around the cause of uh, extracurricular activities. We can band together around the cause of a heritage or, or even, as we've mentioned here before, a building or, or different things like that. And, and what we need to band together for, men, and what we need to rule over 
is making sure that God gets what he wants from us. That should be our primary burden here. God, you have to get the preeminence. What you want to have happen needs to happen here. How you want to lead us needs to happen. And we should be praying and believing and and working as a church family, and especially as men, banding together around that concept and around that reality. If you look throughout the, the, you know, the reality of what Nehemiah has to work with here, he can, he can look back in the, in the history of Israel and, and point these men to, to Moses. He can say, you know, look at Moses. He wasn't anything special. Uh, <coughs> he grew up, you know, uh, in, in Pharaoh's house, really, in, in many ways. It was, uh, he, he was a miracle to begin with. Uh, but he grew up in Pharaoh's house, and yeah, he had a good education, but, you know, he killed a man, and then, and then he ran off, and he was gone for 40 years in the backside of the desert, probably wondering if God was ever going to use him. And then he comes across God in the burning bush, and God renews his vision for leadership, and, and God takes Moses and, and, and leads God's people out of bondage, out into uh, what, what should have been uh, the promised land. That was God's plan, by the way, was, was for Moses to lead them out of bondage right into the promised land. It was never God's will for the children of Israel to walk the wilderness for 40 years. But along that way, you have a, a man who was willing, and not because he felt like he was called uh, to be some great person. He was humble. He was meek, right? Even the Bible tells us that. But he had God's hand, and he wanted God's blessing more than he wanted anything else. He wanted God to lead, and he wanted God to work. He even had to have somebody come and help him because he didn't feel like he could even talk well enough, right? He called his buddy Aaron, his brother. And, and along the way in the history of the, of the life of the nation of Israel, you see this, 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 this man in, 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 in his weaknesses and in his timidity and in, in his, his failures and in his insecurities, God's still using him because what he wanted more than anything was God. And he wanted God's best for God's people. And they get to the edge of the promised land there and uh, Moses sends out those spies, right? The ten spies. And he sends them off into the promised land to spy out the promise of God. Not to just go in there and see if it's something that's humanly possible, but to go in there and bring back the actual report of God's promise, of God's blessing. And they came back, and right, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the spies brought back a report, right? An evil report. Ten were bad, two were good. Right? Caleb and Joshua tell us the story of, of what of God promised. It's all there. Yeah, the, there's people there. There's giants there. And, and, but listen, now all the things that God said, it's true. It's the promised land. And, and we can. We can. God can do it. And we find, you know, a little later in the, after the wilderness wanderings, after the, the people were discouraged by men who were unwilling to trust God and take God at his word. They, they spent 40 years in the wilderness struggling because they just wouldn't let God have the preeminence. We see Joshua again back on the scene, right? Back at that place and standing on the edge of the Jordan River. A million plus, maybe two million people watching and waiting. Now as Moses is off the scene, Joshua's on the scene. He's pacing the, the, you know, the edge of the Jordan. Lord, what should I do? You know, go forward. <laughs> Get out there in that water. Again, this wasn't the trout stream around the corner, folks. This is the Jordan River when it's overflowing its banks. This is a you get out there, you get washed away. But Joshua wanted God's will more than he wanted what his flesh wanted. He wanted the best for those people. He, they, he wanted them to see God. And when the foot of the soles of those men touched the water, whoosh, 
They walked across on the dry ground, just like they did when they had come out of Egypt. Right. right into the promised land. And you know what happened next. They sat back and enjoyed the promised land with no problems the rest of uh, their history. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it looks like if, that's, if you don't read the rest of Joshua, right? But if you read even just into the next chapter, you know it's battle after battle after battle. But God calls that a time of victory, a time of rest, he calls that. And it wasn't a time of rest because they stopped believing God. It was a time of rest because that's where they began to believe God. We've got to get this in our hearts that when you enter in a time of revival, when you enter into uh, the blessing of God, and when men are leading the charge in this, people have rest. Not because the work ceases. It's because the work is then emphasized upon God and God does everything through you. You're not laboring anymore. You're depending. So we see here in Nehemiah 11 an emphasis on these rulers, these men who are willing to, to step out and do something that was humanly distasteful. They were willing to Make a sacrifice. I, I, I like that phrase there in, in verse number two. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to, the, to dwell at Jerusalem. They, they, didn't, they weren't begrudging, okay? It, it wasn't forced. It wasn't like, okay, all right, Bob, Jim, you guys, sorry, man, bottom of the totem pole, you're in there. You got to hang around in Jerusalem. And uh, sorry, it's a mess in there, but... Uh, uh, We'll be praying for you, brother. No, that's not what it was. Again, you've got to remember the climate. The, the, the temple's up and running. The priests are doing their work in the temple. Uh, the wall is up, so they have some level of protection. Yeah, the city, it, it's, in, it's, it's in bad shape. But listen, there are men who are saying, listen, God's obviously doing something here. God's on the move. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth me stepping out by faith, and, and I'm willing to do that. Hey, I'll do that. Nobody else wants to do that. I'll do that. I, I often remind, I'm reminded of uh, Isaiah chapter number 6 when I, when I read stuff like this. Aren't you? Amen. Right. <clears throat> or, uh, uh, Isaiah said, uh, um, I, uh, I heard uh, Isaiah 6 and verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord. Isn't that great? He's, he's in the temple there. He's, he sees God, you know, the, the, the pillars and everything shaking and everything going on. And, and, and he understands as he stands in the presence of God, all of a sudden he's very sinful and he needs a cleansing as he stands in the presence of God. And he, he gets the coal from off the altar, the seraphim there, right? Uh, having a live coal in his hand, which he's taken from, with tongs from off the altar. And he laid that upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Then he heard the voice of the Lord. Amen. Then he heard the voice of the Lord. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Yeah, I read that spot in Nehemiah, and as I'm reading through it, I, I think of that moment there in, in Isaiah 6 where, where God's at work, and people are getting a hold of a vision of God. They're getting their hearts cleansed, and God's at work, and he's dealing with people, and people are getting right with God, and for the, maybe for the first time in a long time, all of a sudden they're hearing God talk to them again. And what are they hearing? They're not hearing, okay, good job, now sit down and be still. They're hearing the very heart of God from the very throne of God. There's a lot of work to get done. Who can go? Who's going to get off the pew? Who's going to get out and say something? Who's going to sacrifice willingly? I said, I, I don't know what anybody else is doing, but I'll go. There's nothing more important in this world, my friends, than responding to the opportunity to sacrifice willingly for God. 
sacrifice your time and and and, and listen we, we all have that moment where you know I'm, I'm just too busy I, I don't have time anymore I've got all these responsibilities I got all this stuff listen when you set aside those things for the things of God in many ways it's not even a sacrifice but but pastor you don't understand you know I, I got all this listen again it, it, it's not a it's not a pushing match here God's not willing to, he doesn't want to argue with anybody. He just puts the offer out there saying, listen, there's a lot of people in this community that need to be saved. Who's willing to tell them? Who's willing to tell them? Who wants to go? Who wants to sacrifice? In in all honesty, folks, I I think many of us tonight would say, "I, I want to be that person. then be that person. Then be that one. Listen, there was nothing special about Isaiah. (laughs) Just like there was nothing special about Moses. Just like there was nothing special about Nehemiah. Just like there's nothing special about Joshua. They were just willing to go. They looked into the face of their Savior and they said, you're worth it. There's nothing, there is nothing that I wouldn't set aside for you. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, which is a favorite verse of the Cola Clash and Minutemen Ministries, a lot of training that Tim and I and our wives went through, but Jesus says, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. Think about that for a minute. Jesus says, I didn't come so that you could wash my feet. I didn't come so that you could wipe my feet with ointment. That you could carry me uh, uh, you know, on a, uh, on a pedestal and walk me around and everybody could feed me and wash me and take care of me. That's not why I came. I didn't come for that kind of stuff. That's not what this is about. I came to set forth an example I came to be a minister. You know, Jesus also said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And if Jesus came to be a minister, shouldn't we be willing to do the same thing? Jesus came as a servant, didn't he? Right? Didn't he come as a servant? And wasn't he treated like one? Are you a servant? You know, don't, don't we often talk about, listen, I'm a servant. I'm a servant of God. You know, I'm, I'm a servant in the church. You know, we're, we're servants in our community. And folks, why are we so offended when people treat us like one? Jesus says, I'm looking for a willing sacrifice. (laughs) These people were blessed and blessed of their community because they were a willing sacrifice, but they offered themselves to, to dwell in Jerusalem. And here we see again that surrender. They offered themselves. It's just a wonderful, beautiful thing here tonight. They didn't offer their neighbor. (laughs) Hey, I'm going to offer my kids, Lord. (laughs) You can have them and do whatever you want, but as for me, I've got other things going on. Sorry. No, 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 that's not what it was. Uh, They willingly offered themselves. They put themselves on on the front line of God's work. Again, they wanted God to have priority in their life. Listen, uh, men, if we're going to have uh, uh, kids who grow up to love God and to serve God and do great things for God someday, then, then we need to be willing to set forth the example of people who are willing to sacrifice, not begrudgingly, of a free heart, whatever that means for God, and surrender anything that we might have in our possessions to God. Anything. There can't be anything that's, that's off limits to the Lord. 
Pastor, you don't understand how much money I have. Listen, you don't understand how much money God has. But, but you know, this, this stuff, is, it's, it's, it's part of our, our family. It's our heritage. It's, it's, it's what I, my future. It's what I'm planning. Listen, it, it, your future, your past, your heritage, your family name, your money, your 401k, everything, it's all God's. It all belongs to him. And why do we cling so tightly to things that, that one day will mean absolutely nothing? I love the example of David, don't you? I love it. I love the example of David. And I, I, I often, you know, when I read this stuff, I see these men, they're willing to stand up, they're willing to look, you know, the enemy in the face and say, I'm not afraid of you. And I think of David in 1 Samuel 17, and, you know, he's, he's, he comes down to visit his, his, uh, his brothers because he was obeying his dad, and he was coming down to give them some food to make sure they were taken care of. And he gets down there, and he sees Goliath, this Philistine out there, you know, mocking God and God's people. He's looking around, he's like, what are you guys doing standing here? I don't get it. Don't You hear what this guy's saying about God? Why isn't anybody out there? Who's going to shut this guy up? David said, I'll go. Saul's like, no, 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 man. You don't understand. You're just a little kid. Look at that guy. He's like 10 feet tall. His, his spear's like a weaver's beam. He'll chew you up and spit you out. He doesn't know my God. I'll go. You don't want to go dwell in that city. There's, there's no toilets or running water. Everything's burned down. There's nowhere to sleep. You, you, it's not comfortable. The enemy still, you're still vulnerable. You, oh, listen, we'll go. This isn't about me. This isn't about my, me being comfortable. This isn't about me being, you know, uh, getting everything for me. Because I'm not here to be ministered unto. I'm here to minister. This isn't about me having the things that I want. It's not about me fighting for the things that I want. It's not about me fighting for my name or my heritage or my this or my that. This is about God getting glory out of this church. If that means giving my life, then I'm going to do it. And David said, listen, this is about God's glory, and you guys are all messed up here. Is there not a cause? You guys are confused. This guy doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know my God. I'll go. I don't need your armor, I don't need your spears, I don't need your swords, I don't need your stuff. Give me my slingshot, give me my stones, and give me that guy right there. And he walked out there, and Goliath laughed at him, and he says, my God's going to take care of you. Put that thing in there, whoomp. One stone right to the forehead knocked him down, and he went out there and cut his head off. That's what I'm talking about, folks. You don't get that moment in the Christian life if you're not willing to step out in a moment of surrender. Listen, there was a fully trained army, men head and shoulders above David, They've been training their whole life to fight men like that. And they stood weak-kneed, shivering and shaking like a bunch of elementary kids. Maybe that's not the way to say that. Because I think our elementary kids wouldn't stand shaking weak-kneed. I think they'd be looking for dad. David said, thy servant will go and fight. I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to go. And you want to know what? Jesus wasn't afraid to surrender his life either. Jesus wasn't afraid to surrender his life either. And again, just to reiterate the verse, John 20, 21. As my Father hath sent me, so send I you. My friends, Jesus didn't call us here to live a life for ourselves like these men and these people, he called us to a life of sacrifice, willing sacrifice, 
and a life of surrender. To set aside our own personal endeavors, our own personal uh, uh, you know, uh, thoughts and ideas that we have. We've got to get it out of our head that somehow we pigeonhole God. <clears throat> this is, I can't do this. I can't do that. I won't do this. I won't do that. Listen, that's not willing sacrifice. That's not surrender. Willing sacrifice and surrender says, I can't, but God can. I'm not, but God will. I'm scared, but God says, fear not. <laughs> I'm not sure how this is going to work, but God will work it out. That's a really big hill to climb, but God will get me up it. That Goliath is really scary, but God will protect me. See, there was a cause, and the cause was God's work. From the beginning of the book of Nehemiah all the way to the end. And listen, if this church is going to move forward, we're going to say this over and over and over again. Men, you have to lead in this. You have to step out. We can't hide anymore. We can't stand like David's brothers or the rest of the men in the fray saying it's good enough just to stand here and watch this Philistine mock God. We have to be willing like David to step out and sacrifice and surrender everything so that God can get the glory. God wants to get glory in the church. Did you know that? And it's time for us to step out and do that. Listen, when God leads you this week to do something, pray. Take a step of faith and spend some time in prayer. Pray out loud. If God leads you to speak a word of witness to somebody, do it. Who cares who's around? If God leads you this week to get involved in somebody's life in some way, shape, or form, then do it. God's asking you to take a step of faith uh, in some way, shape, or form, my friend. Do it. God can. It's his glory that's at stake here, my friends. And he wants to use you to get it done. And the people blessed all the men. People take note. People notice when the men step up. The church thrives when the men step up. The church thrives. The people take note. Listen, there's life there. There's activity there. There's things happening there. Why? Because the men got their eyes off the things of this world and they got their eyes on God. They set aside the things of, of, of the temporal and they engage the spiritual. So who tonight will go? Who's willing to step out from the fray? Who's willing to take on the Goliaths that we're going to be facing in the days ahead? Who's willing to take their eyes off the temporal and put their eyes on the spiritual, on the eternal? Who's willing to sacrifice? Not begrudgingly, but who's willing to step out and say, I'm willing. I'll surrender to whatever God wants me to do, wherever God wants me to go, however God wants to lead me. How about it, men? Who is willing to be blessed? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for these men in Nehemiah 11. Thank you for Nehemiah and the rulers and the different men, and even all the ones listed there in the chapter, the porters, the song leaders, Lord, the Levites. Lord, all the ones of the one in ten from the community uh, that, that were willing to come and make that sacrifice to ensure the forward movement of God's work and uh, the preservation of a nation. And, and Lord, we, we, we pray that our church would embrace that same spirit, that the men would be willingly stepping out from, from the things that they, they have in their life and willing to step up for the preservation of God's work here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. 
that there would be men who are willingly sacrifice and, and willingly surrender to whatever it is that, 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 Lord, that you have for them to do. And, Lord, I pray that you'd speak clearly to them as we move forward as a church, as we, as we <clears throat> embrace your will and, Lord, seek your glory to be sh uh, shined uh, from this place, that it would be the light that is drawing uh, the people from this community. Lord, I pray that you put your hand on our men. And, Lord, that all men here, would be willing to step out. Men would be willing to surrender. So Lord, I'm asking for a special blessing tonight. I'm asking for you to speak to the men. And I'm asking you to protect their hearts or deliver them from their insecurities. And Lord, fill their hearts with faith because of you, not because of who they are, but because of who you are. Lord, there's an enemy that mocks us and, Lord, he shouldn't be able to mock us as he is. We're asking tonight that you'd put in our heart a willingness to set aside the things of our hearts and our lives so that you can get glory through us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed here tonight. And, uh, men, I'm going to have the pianist play just a song of invitation. And if God would so leave the altars open, would you come and pray, ask God to use you in a special way in the future of this church? future of our community, the future of your family? Would you be willing to surrender all? Would you be a willing sacrifice here tonight as the pianist plays? You can look this way here just for a second. You know, I'm so encouraged tonight. I don't know, just the heart. The Lord's just filled my heart with just joy. You know, as I look out amongst us, I see some tender hearts and I see men who are who are ready who are willing and who are praying for God to do great things not only in their life but in this church and around our world and it's fun to be a part of that with you all and I just want you to know with with what God's doing here there, there's no limit there's no limit guys there's no limit to what God can do with you all if he could take those, those early disciples and reach the world, then he can surely do that with us. And what makes me even doubly excited is how the kids are responding. There's tender hearts amongst the kids because the tender hearts amongst the men and the ladies and God's working. So be encouraged, folks. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep responding. Keep staying in that position of surrender by God's grace. And I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time and things going to just, God's going to do something great. Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray here tonight. Father, thank you again for the privilege of being a part of this ministry and of these precious folks and these tender men tonight. Thank you that they want to be that David. Lord, they want to be that Moses and Lord, that uh, those men who lead out, those Joshua's and Caleb's and Lord, those Apostle Paul's. Lord, they want to be those men who have an impact not only on their families but on the world. Uh, Lord, use them bless them, uh, help their prayer lives, Lord, to grow immensely in these days, and uh, Lord, uh, do great things with them. Uh, Lord, I pray for grace and strength and vision in my own heart to be a help to them as they come, as they need help and guidance and wisdom along the way. Uh, Lord, I don't know what to offer them other than Jesus. So Lord, thank you that you are the all-sufficient one, and guide them and, and bless them, we pray. Thank you again for this wonderful night together and this encouraging time that, Lord, you can do great things even with us. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are dismissed.